Hello everyone, my name is Pixorifs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you guys are having a good day. In today's episode, we are going to get started on the nether exhibit for the museum. Finally, we're going to start putting a whole section behind here. It's actually going to go behind these couple of rooms here, I think. We'll have one behind the kind of diamond area with the enchanting and stuff going through this nether portal into what I'm planning is going to be a basically a recreation of the nether cavern. It's going to be a pretty large structure with some nether landscape stuff in it. Beyond that, we'll start to go into generated structures like bastions and nether fortresses, and then beyond that, obviously, we'll have an exhibition about netherite. That's going to link into the tools exhibit over there. It's probably not going to be as big as the tools room, but it's going to be a fairly sizable facsimile of the nether cavern right here in the overworld. We're also going to include an actual nether portal in this exhibit, which should mean that we can go through to the section of the nether that relates to stuff that you can't bring to the overworld, like piglins who would zombify if I brought them to the overworld, so that we can do an exhibition in the nether itself on stuff like piglin bartering. So I think we're going to do a time lapse in this episode that's going to be me recreating the nether landscape here in the overworld. We're going to include a few of the different biomes in that, of course, it's not just going to be nether wastes, we're going to have a soul sand valley section, a uh, you know crimson forest section, a warp forest section, and a basalt delta section. So I'm going to have to study each of those biomes a little bit to see if I can reproduce them accurately. And what I'm thinking about maybe doing is having them in really obvious like slices across the floor to make it look like you know this is obviously artificially reproduced nether terrain. And as you wander through each thing, it changes, but it's obviously not like the way natural nether terrain would generate. I like that idea a little bit. I think we might go with something like that, just to, to differentiate it from like actually being in the nether itself. But that is only one of a couple of things that I want to do in this episode. And another one is actually going to be in the nether itself, because partly because I wanted supplies for building this nether exhibit, and partly because it's a project that I've been meaning to take on for a while, I have started to clear out all of the nether terrain around my nether hub, and there was a lot of netherrack here before, which we are now in the process of clearing out. I've mostly been doing this on Twitch streams because it's very grindy work, it's not the kind of thing that I want to do in a regular episode, but there's a lot of effort that goes into this. I could be doing it with stuff like TNT to maybe speed things up or automate it slightly, but the fact that I've already built a nether hub underneath this means that it would be a little bit dangerous to do that. I would end up destroying some of the stuff that I've already built, and to be honest, bits of that is happening already when I remove a piece of nether rack and then there's some lava behind it. Sometimes it gets down into here and burns away all of the carpet, but that is minor compared to the damage a TNT flying machine might do, so I'm pretty determined to cut carve this entire thing out manually. It's not particularly difficult, it's just a little bit time consuming and so I will end up just carving all of this stuff away as we go. And now I'm thinking about repositioning some stuff in my world that I've taken for granted for a while, like this minecart elevator up to the gold farm. The gold farm is not exactly centered on the portal here, it's actually kind of off to one side slightly. And the minecart elevator here basically takes you straight up to the bottom of the gold farm. All I have to do is right click my way up through these minecarts, hop out at the top, and I'm right here by the scaffold that leads up to the gold farm, which I mostly just skip by flying up there now. But I'm thinking that now this is going to be here, and I plan to put a glass roof on top of the nether hub so that you can see down into it as you fly over. It does kind of leave me with this minecart elevator sticking up out of nowhere, more or less. And so what I'm thinking about doing is making a pretty large hole in the bedrock directly above the center of my nether hub. And that way, I'm not wearing gold in the nether, which is why these piglins are taking an unnecessary interest in me. If I have a decent sized hole in the bedrock directly above my nether hub, we can make that pretty cool decoratively, but I can also just use it to fly straight up through the roof instead of having to worry all that much about this minecart elevator, which is useful, but ultimately not the fastest way I could get up if I walk through this portal into the nether hub. I can also ditch the portals from the center of this entirely and relocate them to the nether roof since I use the nether roof a lot for ease of transport anyway but frankly I like having a nether portal at the center of my hub here and I think it'd just be really cool to have something big open above that. So that's the other thing we're going to do in this episode. We're going to try out a couple of different bedrock breaking methods which I've never done before but are apparently a little bit easier than the methods we've been doing before and potentially we could blow a giant hole in the bedrock roof here and have a much easier way to get up to the nether roof.
Hey folks, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the time lapse. And yes, there is an ominous amount of netherrack up here behind the diamond exhibit now. But I think we did a pretty decent job of putting together the start of this nether exhibit. I'm going to walk you through it a little bit because there's actually kind of a lot going on here. And some of it may not have been evident with the shaders on in the time lapse, especially this. I'll explain what this is in a second or two. But first of all, of course, I was worried about lighting. I was worried about the nether cavern being kind of a weird place to emulate in the middle of the museum. I was worried a little bit about mob spawns, and then I realized the nether probably has more light sources than basically any other dimension when you're talking about, like, what's natively there. There is fire just naturally on the ground everywhere, and while I find it kind of weird that a museum is just going to have open flames on the floor, it does provide a nice natural opportunity to light this area the way the nether cavern would naturally be lit. So, that kind of scores at a point in my column, not to mention the fact that we can, of course, hang natural looking clusters of glowstone from the ceiling. And I need to maybe refine my idea of what glowstone clusters in the nether look like, because this one seems maybe a little bit too symmetrical and I wasn't quite sure what to do in terms of the shape of them. They tend to generate in quite odd little shapes. But anyway, uh, we've of course got the netherrack pretty much everywhere and this section is going to be like a tunnel that players can walk through. But of course we got to represent the ores, which are of course quartz and the new gold ore that you find in nether wastes and all of the biomes actually throughout the nether. We've of course got to represent some of the other blocks you will find in a nether wastes biome like gravel. There are still fields of soul sand outside of a soul sand valley, which is where we can introduce the fact that fire burns blue on soul sand. And of course, we got magma blocks that are probably going to lead down to a little tiny lava ocean here. And again, I don't want people to walk around the museum and have open lava that they could just walk into and die. But at this point, I might rope that off or maybe just kind of call people's attention to the fact that it's dangerous to walk in lava. Now, this section here is really meant to represent the nether fog a little bit because I realized one of the things I wasn't going to be able to do in the overworld was have the fog represented. The fog in the nether is quite a prominent feature of it now, and the overworld just doesn't have anything like it aside from render distance fog, which is controllable by the player, whereas in the nether, it's kind of a fixed distance, and while some people choose to play with fog off in order to see a little bit further, I find the fog a really important and atmospheric component of the nether experience now. And so I decided to layer up red glass here in the same way that we've done in the ravine in Founders Forge and in other projects throughout the world so that you get that misty, foggy kind of effect. But I created a kind of nether tube, I guess, kind of coming out of the back of here. It's just an extra box for this exhibit that's kind of all closed off here. We're going to have to light the top of this pretty carefully once the whole thing is enclosed. But of course, that's just there to provide a kind of box in which people can look through into a foggy area of the nether as though this just stretches off into the distance and it kind of gives the illusion that it does with this many layers of glass it's really not quite possible to see through to the back wall unless you are right up close to this thing and I put some glowstone up there to light it and give the impression that there is something in the distance I might even put a couple of zombie pigmen walking around although putting them behind glass would mean that they wouldn't be the kind of thing that could aggro on players. Of course, the next step was to go through each of the biomes. And as you saw in the time lapse, I actually built this stuff up first. And I'm really happy with how these came out. Each section actually lined up really nicely with the adjacent room. And they are five blocks wide each, which meant they were the perfect width to fit in some of the warped and crimson trees. And I think these turned out really, really well. I grew most of them naturally i decided to add a couple of nether warp blocks to this one and add a shroom light in there because once again the natural light of shroom lights is something that could illuminate these exhibits without the need to put down torches or anything else we might add in a little bit of artificial light coming from the ceiling once i cover the entire thing over but i wasn't sure how i wanted to do that if i wanted to continue this nether cavern feeling or because we've got these all basically separated out with nether brick now if I wanted to use some other kind of method or maybe just wrap around the entire thing with nether brick. But I figured we'd get onto structures a little bit later so we wouldn't be seeing nether brick for a while and it made for a really nice kind of appropriate dividing border 
for all of these biomes. So the Crimson Forest is the first one. We've then got the Soul Sand Valley with basalt columns and bone structures, as well as a little bit of that blue fire. Did a little bit of a mix of Soul Soil and Soul Sand, and then coming through to the next exhibit, super fast, because I've got my Soul Speed boots on, we have a Warped Forest kind of in a similar way. Not really any way I can introduce Endermen to this exhibit without them teleporting everywhere, unless I wanted to put them in a boat, which wouldn't feel especially natural. And then finally, we come to the Basalt Delta. And once again, I wanted to put lava in here, but not to the extent that it would damage the player. But the lava in a Basalt Delta does tend to run through the floor in rivers like that, and I didn't want to lose that feel. So what I decided to do, and you can let, you can let me know in the comments if you think this actually works, is to put orange glass over the top of it and have the lava set down into the floor. So you can just walk straight over it without having to like pick your way carefully between the blocks and have a little parkour challenge in the middle of the museum and the lava can stay underneath there lighting the area up with a subtle glow. And I might put a few light sources down in the areas like this where there would be individual lava pockets inside of the basalt spikes but Outside of that, I think it turned out pretty well. And this whole exhibit altogether is actually something that I'm really proud of now. I haven't built much in the way of dioramas like this elsewhere, except in the Nether Hub, which was kind of what gave me the inspiration for doing stripes like this of the different Nether biomes. And I think that turned out really, really well. So I haven't started working on the next section of the Nether exhibit yet, which is going to be all about Netherite first and foremost. We're going to get some ancient debris mining stuff going on in here and, and kind of simulate the process of that. We're also going to have quite a large section, I think, here adjoining this room, and that's going to cover things like nether fortresses and bastions, the generated structures that you'll find in the nether. And I'll probably need to go and take some research material, some reference material. What was that? Hello? Oh, that was an enderman, I think. Um, just saw some particles rising up from the grass there. This is still only one block thick, basically everywhere. So there's potentially some stuff that can spawn in there. Uh, but yeah, we're going to have a uh, basically an example nether fortress segment and an example bastion segment not the full size structures obviously because they're both far too big to reproduce in the overworld it would be a heck of a project for the museum but i think just showing a couple of the rooms maybe like a couple of raised walkways of nether fortress and a couple of broken down segments of bastion we'll be able to get the general idea I did end up moving both of the villages over here. We also need to start breeding these villages over here so we can do a future exhibit about villagers in general. But I think this is all coming together super well and I'm really happy that we finally got the nether exhibit in place. There are so many examples of material and the different stuff you can find in the nether just in this one space. And we've managed to use the space pretty well, I think. I'll probably leave lecterns explaining what each of the biomes are, and maybe a little bit about some of the other stuff that you can see around here, but as far as a first shot at a nether exhibit goes, I'm pretty happy with it. Now let's go to the one part of the nether we can't reproduce here in the overworld, the bedrock ceiling. So as you were briefly able to see at the beginning of that time-lapse segment, I have now removed all of the terrain from around the outside of here, and there are still a couple of spawnable spaces because... Like the fool I was, I decided to put a whole range of full blocks around the outside of my nether hub, and we will be getting rid of those or slabbing them or something, maybe just lighting them up, I don't know. We'll do something to make sure that this area is a little bit more easily spawn-proofed, and we'll also continue the glass out towards the center so we can protect the rest of the structure down here. Got a few pieces of carpet to replace, but I think the compass looks really great now, surrounded by all of these biome dioramas and all of this empty space. I also plan on putting a glass roof over the top of everything so that we end up with slightly fewer ghast attacks as I'm trying to leave the portal and of course we'll get rid of the prismarine because that's going to be spawnable as well. But outside of that this place is looking pretty great so far and I think the next step is going to be to take the coordinates of the center of this because that is going to be the center of the giant hole that we're going to put in the bedrock roof and that is conveniently enough 1 and 57. Okay that's going to be tough to remember but I'll try my best. All right, 1 and 57, so that's all the way over da, 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 there, okay, and there. All right, that right there is the block we want to remove using a new technique that I've learned fairly recently that was actually 
shown to me or rather showcased in a video by Impulse SV from the Hermitcraft server. I believe though this method is attributed to Raiseworks. So I'm going to take a look for a tutorial for this and give a credit for that in the video description because of course stuff like this doesn't come along every day. These are kind of weird methods we're dealing with here and this is hopefully going to be more or less the easiest bedrock breaking method we've been able to do in the series so far. Because the materials you need for it are actually pretty straightforward. We need one block of obsidian, we need a couple of blocks of something easy to mine like netherrack just so it doesn't take up too much time. We need a redstone block, a trapdoor, some TNT, and a piston. We actually need a couple of pistons, so let me craft another one if I've got the ingredients or if I've got one in my redstone box. I have some sticky pistons. I think those will work. We'll try it with and without just to make sure because we want to test this a little bit to make sure we are thorough. So what we need to do is locate that block, which once again is 1 and 57. So it's that one there. That is where we're going to be placing our piston facing up. Next to that, we're going to place a redstone block on that side to activate the piston, an obsidian block there, and behind the redstone block on this side, we're facing north. I don't know if that really makes any difference, but we're doing that anyway because that's what we've done in previous methods. We're going to place two pieces of netherrack there. And the reason we have so much TNT in our inventory is that we're going to explode it and very close to us as well but hopefully in a way that should not deal any damage to us. Now we're going to place a trap door on the side of this piston here. It doesn't really matter if you place it on the lower block or the higher block. I tend to place it on the higher block because then that gives us more access when we crouch down underneath it to placing a block against this obsidian block here. We're basically going to aim for the top corner and as we set off some TNT on top of this redstone block we are going to place a piston here which will hopefully end up replacing this piston facing upwards and that's how we will know that the bedrock has been broken. One thing we will need to do before this though is something a little bit tricksy. We'll either need to set up an auto clicker script for your mouse or to use a spare mouse button if you've got one or something like that to make sure that you can right click as fast as the program will allow which I think is at about 60 hertz like 60 times per second or in my case, what I'm actually going to do is use the controls in Minecraft itself, and we're going to rebind the right-click key. Now, this is a little bit weird, so <laughs> it's it's not necessarily a method you will want to use all of the time because it does then involve using that key to place blocks afterwards. But what we're going to do right now is we're going to rebind the Use Item and Place Block button to the keyboard key Y. We're going to use Y. And you may be wondering why, and it's because if you hold down a key on your keyboard, it will input the letter as fast as possible. Imagine like you're using a word processor, like a notepad document or something like that. If you hold down the key, it just prints a line of Ys. So what we're going to try and do is hold down that key to try and place a piston here at the split second that the TNT explodes the piston that's already in place here. And that in theory, should generate the same glitch that we've used to break bedrock at other times in the series. So I'm going to place the TNT and the sticky piston on my hotbar like so. We're going to place the TNT up here using the Y key and then once again, turn around here, use the Y key to spam click here. And it looks like it didn't work because the piston is unfortunately facing downwards. Well, no worries. We can remove the piston and try again and we'll see if the sticky piston method does work. Oh yeah, I have to press Y to place blocks now. I've got to get used to this because I'm going to be doing it an awful lot. There we go. We'll place that block there. We're going to place the netherrack back in place. And this method is a little bit finicky. It doesn't always work. Once again, these glitches are not an exact science. So we're going to be trying them a couple of times. Hopefully they will work though. And I might end up crafting a regular piston because I've seen this done with regular pistons and not sticky pistons if this doesn't work. Yeah, that didn't work the second time either, but thankfully TNT now drops 100% of the blocks it breaks, meaning that we don't have to worry too much about the uh, the cost of any of the materials here. The only thing you're actually losing is the TNT, and believe me, I have a lot of TNT left over from when I was mining for netherite, so we actually have quite a decent amount that we can waste on a project like this. So once again, I'm going to try my best to place that against the block. We're going to turn, we're going to place the sticky piston facing upwards, looking at that top corner, and yeah, it hasn't worked again. Okay, well that's three times now. I'm going to try one more time and then we'll see if we have to use a regular piston instead of a sticky piston because for whatever reason the game might see a difference between the two when it comes to doing whatever this glitch does. This time around I'm going to try it with the sticky piston here and the regular piston in my hand and we'll try just looking up at that block there making sure we're placing the piston facing down. 
Yeah, it doesn't look like it's worked. Okay, let me go craft a piston and we'll try it with two pistons just in case that makes a difference. Okay, I'm back and let me tell you, it was a little bit weird flying around when I hadn't rebound my uh, use key again. So I ended up with having to fly with fireworks using the Y key. A little bit weird. Anyway, uh, hopefully this should work. This time we got a piston instead of a sticky piston this time. We're going to do the same trick as we did before. Just placing a TNT there and then immediately coming back over here and looking upwards at the corner of this and then holding down the Y button. And it sounded like that time it worked. We heard a piston sound effect in that explosion. The piston is facing upwards and as we remove it, you should see, yes, there is one piece of bedrock missing. We have broken a hole in the bedrock. Now, obviously that's not broken it all the way down through this patch of bedrock here. And we're gonna have to do this a whole bunch of times if I want to clear a large enough area. So once again, I think we're gonna kick this into overdrive and do this in the form of a time-lapse. Hey folks, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the time lapse and yeah, I did end up dying in the middle of that process. I ended up turning too far, placing a TNT instead of a piston. It all went wrong and that TNT timing was just too quick for me to escape. But as you can see, we basically dug out a more or less like a, a, a half moon kind of shape. Not even a half moon. <laughs> it's, this is a, a waxing moon, if anything. It is, it is a very shallow semicircle here in the bedrock and we're probably going to go a little further out than this because I actually want this to be quite large but that took about 50 minutes the time lapse that you saw was just under an hour basically of me messing around with pistons and I sort of developed a rhythm for it after a while it was one of those things where like half the time I was really confident that it was going to break the bedrock and it did and the other half of the time I wasn't entirely sure if it was you just sort of develop a feel for it after a while which is weird and there are still some times when it stays pretty inconsistent but as far as bedrock breaking methods go I was able to do all of this basically in less than an hour that is much much faster than any other method we've used previously and so hats off to Ray's works and the folks who've 
gone through with this method it is absolutely brilliant and unfortunately none of these really constitute a way back down through the bedrock as we can see but of course we already have one of those i am going to have to dig out a second layer possibly even a third and a fourth to get all of this bedrock out of the way but i think i'm going to continue doing that on twitch live streams and various other places where i feel like i can just go at it for a little while and not have to worry too much about episode deadlines and stuff like that because it is a little bit late here and I wanted to get this episode out to you guys today so hopefully you guys will have enjoyed this episode. Couple of time lapses, bunch of nether action and hopefully a good episode overall. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixariffs. Leave a like on the episode if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see more and I'll see you guys soon. Take care, bye for now.